recording. All right, so we are recording. I know the audio is good. Recorder is on, and I just have to put our browser on the projector. Let me all set up. Almost. There we go. All right, right on time too. Yes. Absolutely. So we'll go over the just functions homework assignment. <clears throat> so that is right here. And we'll go over the questions one at a time. All right. So the first question is asking, given that X is a set with A, B, C as elements, Y is a set with 1, 2 as, an, as elements, what is the Cartesian product between those two? Um, so the answer has to start with the curly brace because the answer has is a set. So missing the curly braces would cost some points. Um, so then we have A1, B1, C1, and then me being lazy as I am, is just going to copy and paste and then change all the ones to twos. <coughs> you can do it. You can use an editor outside. Do all the editing and then just paste the answer in. I mean, that works too. All right. So do we have any questions about the answer to the first question? What is the Cartesian product between X and Y? Nope. Okay. We're all good on this one. All right. So we move on to the second question. Referring to the definition in the previous question, what is the Cartesian product? What is the cardinality of the Cartesian product between X and Y? The answer is six because we can quite easily count that there are, there are six elements in this particular set. So I'll be good with uh, the answer to question number two. This is one of the ones here that can be automatically graded. Are we good? Okay, excellent. So question number three is when things start to get a little bit interesting. Enumerate, which means list, all the uh, sets that can be considered functions using X as domain and Y as codomain, you can consider using a program to generate this answer. For this, for this answer, use one line for each set that can be considered a function using X as a domain, Y as a codomain. All right, so there are systematic ways to do this, okay? Because every single function will need to map A to something, B to something, whoops, B to something, C to something. So they should all follow this particular template. Are we, are we good on that one? Okay. So that means this is a template. And because this is a template, I'm going to make a copy of the template before filling in the template itself. And I can also utilize um, a number list. So this way it can, it can do all the counting for me. So I don't have to do the counting myself. So there we go. So now we just paste it here so I can have the template available. So the systematic way to do this is to say, okay, you know, they all map to one. And then you go like this one, whoops, maps to one, maps to one, this one maps to two. Okay. <clears throat> and then this one also maps to two, and this one maps to one. Okay, and then both map to two, like so. And then, you know, being as lazy as I am, it's time to copy and paste and just change all the A's to map to two as well. One, two, three, four. Okay, that's the answer. All right, do you see binary numbers in this answer? If you see the binary number, that's great, okay? Because you're recognizing that, oh, so each one can only map to one or two, which means it's, it's a binary choice. You only get two choices, which can, which can also be seen as quote unquote zero and one, even though they are not actually zero and one, but you can treat them as zero and one. So if you treat one as a zero and treat two as a one, then this whole thing is just zero, zero, zero. This is zero, zero, one. This is zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. We're just counting forward. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in binary. 
Are we okay with this so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so moving on to question number four. So question number four is asking how, based on how many x and y are, how, okay, based on how x and y are defined in earlier questions, how many subsets of x, the Cartesian product of x and y are not functions? So the first thing you need to do is to figure out how many subsets can we generate out of the Cartesian product of x and y. So that would be a first question, first question to answer. So how do you figure that out? In other words, I'm looking at this particular set here. It has six elements. The question is, what is the total number of subsets that I can generate out of these six elements? What is the approach to do that? It's yes. Six. It's two to the power of six, but how did you figure that out? Um, so power set, um... It is related to power set, but you know, but just because you know, Wikipedia says you know the power set of a set has you know two to the power of the cardinality of the set that is used to generate the power set, it's not enough, okay? Because you know, you're just reading off of Wikipedia. The question is why. I'm just going to use the technical term twofold permeation of each element, right? So mm -hmm. you can have, like, well, they're obviously like two in each there, but that's not related to how we calculate the power set. How we calculate the power set, power set is we calculate the permeation of each element with each element in that set of the power set. So I think, like, if you did that, like, say, A, A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, B2, and vice versa, you would have two to the power of one, two, three, four. Six elements. Okay, that's one way to look at it. But a, uh, a more intuitive, at least to me, way to look at this is each element may be present or it may be absent. So you got two choices per element in this particular set. So if the first element, or what I call the first element because it's not really sorted, so if A1 can be absent or present, then B1 can also be absent and present, but whether B1 is absent or present is independent to A1, and then C1 is, is independent to the other two and so on. So you have two choices, times 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 two choices, and that's why we have two to the power of six, which is 64. Is that okay? That's, everybody just kind of understand why uh, there are 64 subsets given this particular set here, okay? So the answer is 64, but that's not the answer because 64 is the number of subsets that we can create out of those six elements. The question is asking, um, out of those, how many are not functions because of this negation here? Yep. Okay, so is what you like um, to get crack up the question and try to answer it? Or are you going to explain it? Because I was just gonna um, just kind of think up loud with my um, Okay, sure. Right Go ahead. So based on the hint that you provided, since U has three elements and we work out W being as um, as a subset of U, we're relating the cardinality between U and B, right? <coughs> so because of that, we take three to the power um, is that what I did? I think so. It's 2 to the power of 3, not... 2 to the power of 3, sorry. 2 to the power of 3, which is um, 8, right? Mm -hmm. And so we look at that, and look how it, um, we can relate the, the coordinate between B and B. It's the power up. Now, relating that to the subset of the coordinate of X and Y, we obviously know the amount of subsets there are in total, 64. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I said, oh, okay, so since we need... A, B, and C to at least be mapped to at least one, uh, to, to be mapped at least one to the uh, codomain for it to be a function, then we would have to just um, subtract two to the sixth power to minus uh, two to the third power. Mm -hmm. And the answer, I think, would be 56? Yep. Oh. Yep, 56 should be the correct answer. Oh, 56. <laughs> I didn't know. Because it's 64 minus eight. 64 is the total number of subsets of this particular set. So that's why that's how we come up with the 64. And then there are eight, eight of those are actual functions. So since the question is asking you know, how many are not functions, so it is 64 minus eight. Uh, you know, I didn't even realize that we already um, listed 
Okay. But you got the right answer. Okay. Question? I entered 56 and I got the wrong answer. Okay, so that means the key is wrong. You know, I have to regrade it manually. Yep. Alrighty. So are there any other questions related to this assignment? No questions? Yep. Can I explain the empty set? Well, the empty set is the uh, is basically saying every one of these is absent. Then you have the empty set, so it corresponds to zero 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 because they are all absent. Let me let me see if he still has you know. Let me see if I answer your question. Um, just that um, last thing you said that empty set is a function. So I'm just wondering. No, I did not say every set is a function. Um. This question, you know, the question number three is asking you to list every subset of this thing here that is a function, and there are eight of them. So when you consider all the subsets of this particular set, there are 64 of those, of which eight are functions, and th these are the eight that are actually functions. The rest are not functions. But there are still subsets of the Cartesian product between x and y. It's just that they are not functions. They do not meet all the requirements to be a function. So let me confirm first. Did, did I answer your question? OK, all right, go ahead. Um, my question is just in passing. It is that I just have to note lowercase epsilon. Lowercase epsilon. I don't think we have introduced lowercase epsilon here yet. OK. All right, so any other questions related to this quiz or homework? Okay, if there are none, I will submit and see that my answer is wrong in the last one. No, I got four, I got four out of four points. So I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay, so when I go back, I cannot see my answer anymore. So it's going to be in uh, you should be able to see it now because I think I released the answer okay. today. Or if I have not, I can do it now, making sure that you guys can read, can see the answer of your own. Okay. Uh, let students see their quiz response. Incorrect answer would be marked. Yep. Okay. Uh, there we go. And save. So you should be able to see it now. Mm -hmm. All righty. So, any other questions? I actually had a question. Yeah. Uh, let's say we couldn't, we didn't make the insight that to like consider the set as like two uh, to the sixth. Mm -hmm. Like, what would be another approach to getting the answer? Well, you still need to know how many subsets there are. Sure. So, one way is to look at Wikipedia, and then Wikipedia would. Okay, you still need to know what the term is. You know, what is the num, what, what is the set of all the subsets? You know, that's called the power set. Um, and like, was that concept? Did it? Did we go over that in the module? Nope. It was. It was specifically something that I add here, so to to kind of have you guys to think about it, and to come up with the answer. Okay. Because the the concept of a power set is no more than just. The power set of X is the set of all the subsets of X. Sure. So it's, it's no more than just definitions that we have already talked about in this class. So it's a question of, you know, how do you, if, and that's why, you know, I give you, I gave you, you know, in the question, there's a hint that says, you know, okay, if you just have looked at three elements, how many subsets can you generate out of that set that only has three elements? Because with three elements, you can really kind of go through every single one, you know, because you can do it intuitively. You don't need a systematic way to do it. But as you do it you know, intuitively, then you will start to notice a pattern, you know, and go like, oh, okay. So if I look at this, you know, there's a certain pattern to it. What if I add one more element to it? Then you just go like, oh, I just take everything that I had before and add the fourth element, 
as you know one one chunk and then you know take the take the one from before verbatim without the fourth element and that's it so you multiply the total number by two every time you add an element to the, the original set so that way you can kind of expand it out and go like oh so with six of them it becomes two to the power six so yep that's a corollary question so yeah like, i'm just trying to understand like the nature of the power set so is, is it not a proper subset of the original set itself or is it a it doesn't have to be proper it's just subset of so the power set of x is the set that can the set containing all the subsets of x but it's subset of not proper subset of so without the proper which that means your x itself is a part of is an element of the power set of itself another question if, uh, could you show like the mathematical notation for power set um you mean the notation yeah i cannot remember the uh, law tech way to do it but you know there's a special okay. function so if you look up Wikipedia power set, um, Wikipedia has the same notation, which means you know the notation, this kind of funky looking P here, I believe you can, oh, I guess not. Um, I thought you can, oh, okay, denote it as blah, 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 and blah. Okay, so in, uh, are you talking about the LaTeX notation? Yeah. So the LaTeX notation of this you know, kind of funny looking P is backslash math bb and then embrace uh, p. Mm -hmm. So that's the one way to kind of generate this particular funny looking p. But you can also just use italic p, you know, because you know, not a whole lot of people know LaTeX. So just your know, regular p is fine too. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. So, you know, it does require a little bit of thought, okay, to get all the questions. Um, but other than that, you know, I think it's, I think it's a fair, you know, homework assignment. Given the week, right, I mean, that should be fine. All right. So are we ready to talk about the um, exam from last semester, from spring 2023? Okay, all right. But before that... <laughs> Uh, let me just you know, uh, provide a resource to people you know, in case you know, someone wants to get uh, tutoring for this class. Um, you can just look up American River College Mesa. And here we have uh, the homepage of Mesa. They are on the first floor right next to the STEM home base. But there's a little bit of you know, uh, requirement. You, in order to be eligible as a person being tutored, you have to be a first generation college student uh, working toward a transfer degree, uh, qualify for financial aid and be majoring in the STEM field and computer science is definitely a STEM field. The only question I cannot answer is whether these two are conjunctions uh, ended or not. So you know, is first generation college student sufficient or you know, does that person also have to qualify for financial aid. That is the one part that I do not know, okay? So if you qualify for one but not the other one, you might want to just go downstairs and ask. Um, so at the Mesa Center, they have tutors that can tutor a variety of topics. So if you qualify you know, to become, you know, to be tutored, I would highly recommend that as an, as an additional resource for you know, being tutored you know, for this class and many of your other classes. All right, so with that all said, I'm going to switch to the tablet because I'm we are ready to talk about the solution of the test from last semester. <clears throat> so let me see, let's see, R, C, P, Y. Yep, there we go. And let me move it to the projector. There, okay. So I'm doing this the first time, you know, I'm not sure you know, how well this is going to work, but we'll find out. All right. So, um, you know, this is from last semester. And there are a few things I really should kind of go over as well. Okay, so this usual scroll doesn't work. And this scroll doesn't work either. Huh. Okay, so how am I supposed to scroll now? Hmm. That is very interesting. I'm just thinking, how do I scroll here? 
single finger. Oh, it did scroll. It just took a long. It just took a long time to do it. Okay. And why is it? What? Okay. All right. Pinch to zoom is off. Okay, so it's just fing single finger to scroll. Looks like. Okay. Okay, it's not it's not scrolling, you know, in a very user friendly way, but I guess you know that will work too. All right, so this exam is an individual exam. No collaboration is permitted. Uh, you can bring anything that is on paper to help you with this exam. So it can be something that you, something from your own notes. You can print the modules. If you can find all the previous, you know, exam one for this class, you can bring all of those with answers. Okay, you know, so anything that is on paper, printed or handwritten, is fine. No electronic, you know, medium. Um, so no cell phones, you know, no tablet, no iPad, and so on. Hmm? That's fine too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just remember, you have limited desk space. That's the issue with this classroom. Is you've only got so much desk space, so you want to make sure that it is easy to go through your own material, um, so that you don't have to kind of drop things and you know, have to get things out of your bag all the time. Yes. Um, for the time, is it set one hour and twenty minutes, or can it be like to go a little bit over the time? Not a single second over. So everybody, so the, the test will start in our case sharp at 3 p.m. and it will stop at 4.20 p.m. All right, so I don't do wiggle room. <laughs> you can always factor in wiggle room yourself. You can tell yourself the test only lasts seven minutes, so the other 10 minutes is extra. So that's one way to look at it. Hmm? Mm -hmm. All right, so, all right, do not share or discuss any part of this exam with anyone in class or otherwise on the day of the exam. Um, basically, there may be people who have not taken the exam for various reasons, so I don't want anyone to disclose the questions to other people. Grading is based on explanation and steps, demonstration of understanding of knowledge and problem-solving skills, not only the final answer. So that means you know, anyone who only gives me the final answer on questions where I ask for explanation will not get a whole lot of points. Sufficient explanation means your answer co uh, connects definitions and concepts discussed in class via logical and or mathematical steps to find the answer of a question. So scroll up. Um, we are continuing here. So I have in this particular case, you know, predefined a few functions. Uh, P1 is a, pre it's not, well, it is a function, but it's also a predicate. So P1 of FDE is defined this way, P2 is defined this way, P3 is defined this way, and so on. So do you recognize any one of these definitions? What is P1, what is P2, and what is P3? Those are related to concepts that we have talked about already, related to functions. Are Go ahead. Hmm? Are they tautologies? They are, no, these are definitions. Okay. So they're not intrinsically true or false, okay? These are just definitions. So in order for P of one of FDE to be true, this has to be true. So what does that remind you? What is the, what is the meaning of P of one? Is it biconditional, like if and only if? No. It, it makes use of a conjunction, but you know, do you, okay, so we have to read this, okay? Don't just guess it, okay? Don't throw a dart in the dark, okay? Read it step by step. What does it mean? F is a subset of the Cartesian product of E, okay? Since when do we care about subsets of the Cartesian product between two sets? Functions, okay. So this looks like one of the requirements to be a function. 
in order for f to be a function, it has to be a subset of the Cartesian product of the domain and the codomain. So now we have a strong suspicion that P1 is really just saying that f is a function where d is the domain and e is the codomain. But that's just a suspicion, okay? So we have to finish reading that whole thing. So with a conjunction, it says you know, for all w in d, the cardinality of a, an ad hoc set uh, where each element is a two-duple of wy such that there exists wy um, such that there exists wy such that wy is in f. That is the same thing as what we saw when we define you know, what a function is, what qualifies a subset of a of the Cartesian product between a set and another, another set as a function. So P1 just confirms whether something is a function or not, where D is the domain and E is the codomain. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So being able to recognize these definitions based on what we have talked about in this class is important. Okay. You are basically tested right here to see whether you recognize these things or not. What about P of 2? Well, in order for P of 2 to be true, P of 1 has to be true first. So that means you know, F has to be a function before we even consider this part here. But this part here, where the mouse cursor is going over, is really just asking. Um, it is seen from the perspective of the codomain. It is asking for each element in the codomain is it mapped to only up to once? Okay, that's basically what it's asking. So which property of a function are we really talking about here? Injection, very good. So with the next one, even if you don't read the whole thing, you probably can guess it is surjection. So if at P of one is true, if and only if F is a function that has a domain of D and a codomain of E, P2 is true if and only if F is a function to begin with, D is the domain and E is the codomain, and the function is injective. P3 is kind of the same thing, except it is surjective. All right, yep. Uh, just double checking, you are uh, recording. You are correct. I am recording and the audio is good, video is good too. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. So then we define, yep. So for V3, is it subjection? So if the definition of subjection is only greater than one, there's no, okay, so you have greater than or equal to one. So in the definition, the subjection is only greater than one. No. So it's greater than and equal to? It's greater than or equal to. Oh. So if you're reading out of my notes, you know, I should be ashamed of myself because that would have been wrong. I hope it's not. <laughs> yes. So when you look at your own definition, you know, double check that your definition in your notes is correct. Okay? You know, because that's really important so that you don't use wrong information in the test. Okay? All right. So moving on. Um, F being a function, mapping from D to E is bijective, if and only if PB, which is you know, just the conjunction between P2 and P3, is true. It is injective but not surjective, you know, blah, 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 blah. So the rest is really just you know, Boolean symbols, and you should be able to read all that by yourself. All right, so just the in, this is just the instruction of the, of the exam. Okay? We haven't really gotten to the first question yet. But remember to read all the instructions, you know, because I assume that everybody's going to read the instructions, and I will grade your answers as such. So make sure that you read all the instructions. Oh, this is also important. All questions carry equal weight. I do not intend to change this part. So that means, you know, what is your strategy? Okay, just generally speaking, what is the strategy that you're going to use to take an exam when you are already told that every single question has equal weight? The infinite monkey approach, okay? Well, that's, if you can stop time, that would be an, an appropriate, you know, strategy. Yes? Okay, there are two things, you know, you're correct. So if all questions carry equal weight, find the easiest one to start with, okay? Because, you know, different people can start with different ones, okay? Because some people may look at one question and go like, oh, 
this is a hard one. I'm not going to start with that. But the next person can go like, oh, this is an easy one for me. I'm going to start with that one. So I cannot tell you which one you should start with first, but you should do a quick scan and find out which one you feel the most comfortable with and start with that one. But there's a second part to the strategy. Time yourself. Okay, Go to the last page. Find out how many questions there are total. So you want to allocate enough time so that you have enough time to go through every single question at least once, but with a little bit of time left so they can go back to, to a question that you may not have enough time to, go, to complete earlier. Okay, So that would be the general strategy for most exams. Okay, you know, That would be the strategy, strategy that I would take you know, in, uh, in an exam. All right. So any questions about the strat general strategy for taking an exam like this one? Okay. If not, we're going to move forward. All right, so question one has a bunch of parts because each one is really simple, and it doesn't really tell you that you have to show me all the steps. So without you know, explicit instructions like that, you can just you know, give me the answer. All right, so every single question looks about the same, but they're not exactly the same, so we have to be super careful about that. All right, so with the first one, or part uh, A, okay, let me hide this thing here. So with part, you know, with the first one, uh, okay, it just misunderstood that I wanted to go back to the previous page. So with this one, it says, you know, find combinations of, find a combination of V and W to satisfy the constraint of blah, 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 okay? So we want the union to be exactly you know, J, A, M, B, C, K in this case. We want uh, V minus W to be just your know, C and K, and we want the intersection to only contain J and A. So how would you approach this question? This is, by the way, the easiest one of all the other ones because you know, it's, everything is just a equality. First of all, what is what each symbol is representing, right? What, is, what, is, what does it mean when it's a union? What does it mean when we looks, it looks like we're subtracting? And what does it mean when we are looking at the intersection? Yep? So the union means what is found in both B and W. The difference is the subtraction is um, what is found in um, what's found in B, but it's not in W. And the intersection, oh wait, I put it wrong. The intersection is um, B was also was in B and was also in W. Yes. But the union is the combination of both. Sorry. It can be fine in at least one. At least one. Because it can be both, but at least one. Okay. So that means J and A has to be found in both, right? So the my approach is going to be okay, we got J A, J A here. And then we can only have C and K in V, but not W. So C and K, Jack, <laughs> is in V, okay? So now the last constraint is, what about um, M and what about B? Well, since they cannot be in V, they have to be in W. So now we have M and B like that. So that would be my approach. It doesn't have to be your approach, but that's you know, how I would answer this particular question. All right, so looking at the next one, so the next one, instead of a, of a equal to, it has a does not equal to. See how this is different? So now we have to say, okay, we don't want the union to be exactly J, A, M, C, B, K, but the rest are still the same. So I'm looking at the constraints and go like, hmm, all right, so the intersection of, uh, okay. I'm not sure exactly what happened. There we go. I think I, my palm, yeah, my palm just touched something. Okay, so we have, uh, the, what is common is still common. So we have JA still here. And then we have uh, CK only in V, like so. But the union is not going to be the same as J and CBK. So that means I'm done. I can just say, that's all we need. Because nobody says you know, what M and B has to be. It just cannot be a part of the union. So just leave them out all in, entirely. So the next one has a not equal to when it is coming to the C and K. 
which means you know, the intersection can be anything other than C and K. Can it be the empty set? Well, yes, because the empty set is not the same as the set CK, meeting that requirement, right? So with this one, you know, the only real requirement here is JA should be found in both. So we have JA in both. And the intersection cannot be CK. Well, that's easy to, fig you know, easy to figure out. One has C, one has K. Okay, that would, you know, oh, wait, 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 that. Mm, okay, CK cannot be found in just V but not in W. So this would meet that requirement because you know, now uh, the only C is found in V, but K is not found in V. So we have met the requirement of the difference between V and W is not C and K. But I still have the equality in terms of the union. So that means I have to figure out you know, where to put M and B. I would put them both here. Okay, so M, B would be both here because I cannot well, I suppose I can put M and B anywhere, actually, in this case, because there's no actual requirement other than, you know, C and K cannot be only in V but not in M. Yep. C and K. C and K cannot be found in just V but not in W. So this is just one of many ways to make it happen. So, wouldn't C K gonna be in W? Hmm? Okay, V minus W means, you know, what is in V but not in W. We just have to make sure that not only C and K are found in V but not in W. So the order of C K wouldn't really matter because of the set, but the order of difference between V and W would because that would be... That is correct. Yep. Go ahead. Well, you had your hand up earlier. Me? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just putting my hand. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, but there are many ways to satisfy the requirement. This is just one of many. All right, so do you guys want me to finish the whole thing, or you guys got the idea and go like, okay, I think we got enough of this? Did you just do the last one? Hmm? The last one? Yeah. Okay, so, yep, okay. Oh, so we can, we're working on the last one, which is this one here. Find the combination again, and this time we have we want the union to be the same, it would be that. C, uh, the difference cannot be just you know, C and K, and then the intersection cannot be J, A. That's a super easy one. Yeah. Just put everything in V and nothing in W. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does everybody caught the answer? Okay, I'll just write it out. You know, so this is J, A, M, B, C, Okay, and that's nothing right there. All right, so question number one, even though it has multiple parts, it's relatively easy to work on as long as you remember what is intersection, what is difference, and what is union as operations on sets. So now we move on to question number two. So question number two says you are given A, which has B, M, Q in it, B has DCM in it, and C has KAQ in it. Furthermore, you're also given that F2 is a function mapping from A to C, and that F2 is MKBAQQ. Okay, so do we have any questions about just this part of the question? What is presented to you? Okay, all right. So the first part of the question asks, what is the value of f of 3? And f of 3 is described as some kind of mathematical gibberish. And your answer should start with f3 equals 2. So it doesn't ask you for the steps to derive f of 3. It just wants to know what is f of 3 according to how it is defined here. So you have no choice but to figure out what that means. <laughs> so what does that mean? We have seen this already. This is a really clumsy way to do something, but, yep. X and Y, so shot, there exists uh, a relation Y comma X for... Y, Not relation, this uh, is function. For, for a function Y comma mm -hmm. X, um, Y comma X within the set of F2. So we need to find um, a pair Y, X within F2. 
and then that would be that chunk of that ad hoc. And then we find F3 such that X comma Y would be this, be the same as X, as Y comma X. So the way I would read this is F of three is a set, okay? That's up to here, such uh, in which each element is a two tuple X, Y, such that there exists Y, X, such that Y, X is an element of F2. So can someone tell me a more concise way to describe this? Yes. Basically, if you put the values of X and Y, their values should be found in F2. F3 is the inverse of F2. Okay. That's basically what it says. Okay. So now the question is, given F2 is defined like this, what is the inverse? MK becomes KM, BA becomes AB, and then QQ is still QQ. That's it, right? Okay, so we say F2, F3, sorry, is the set that has KM, AB, and QQ in it. All right, so that answers you know, part one. Part two, it asks, what is the value of P1 applied to F3CA? In other words, if I use C as the potential domain, a as the poten potential codomain, and I use F3 as quote unquote the function, what is P of one of that? So do you still remember what P1 means? P1 is true if and only if it's a function. Okay, so now the question is, is F3 a function? Okay, all right, so it is a function, so it's true, oops. And since it is true, you don't have to worry about if the value is false, okay? Because of that is only applicable if the answer is false to begin with. So now in F3, we want to construct F0 is a function that maps from A to B. F1 is a function that maps from B to C, such that F0 is bijective, F1 is bijective, uh, such that F2 of X is the same thing as applying f0 on x first, then apply f1 to the result of f of f0 of x. Oof, okay, that's a mouthful. All right, so what does that mean? So now we are interpreting what the question is asking. All right, so it means that we have to construct two functions, and, you know, and hence you know, there's a little prompt here to fill in you know, what is f0 and what is f1. F0 has to be bijective, F1 also has to be bijective. Okay, we got that, we know what is bijection. Um, and also such that F of two of X is basically the compound function of F0, F1 applied to X. Okay, so how, how would you appro approach that problem? Yep. I would find F sub zero and f sub one first, and then I would find the composite function by putting f sub zero inside of f sub one, and okay. that would give me f sub two. So that's, that's a way to do it, and you know, my way of doing it is to look at it as you know, three things. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, a to b, so we have b, m, q, this is set a, and then set b has d, c, m, and then set c, has KAQ, KAQ, okay? So what we want to do is to map B eventually to what? B eventually has to map to A, and then M eventually has to map to Q, and then, um, no, B has to map to, B maps to A, M maps to K, and then Q maps to Q. And we want to define you know, um, a function that's, a, that's going from A to B and another function that maps from B to C. The one that maps from A to B is F0. The one that maps to, from B to C is F1. Okay, so we'll put a label here. F0, this is F1. So there are many ways to do this. Just show me one way to do it. 
So I can say, oh, we'll, we'll just do it like this. And D goes to A. And then we can map M to C. And then from C, it's going to map to K. And then Q maps to M first. M then maps to Q. So now, um, if you look at F0, what is F0 now? F0 is BD, B maps to D, uh, M maps to C, and then Q maps to M. And then what is Q1? Okay, you can just read it off of the picture, right? So we got D mapping to K, no, D maps to Q, and then we have C mapping to K, and then we got uh, M, wait, okay, I missed, oh, that's an A, okay. Poor penmanship, that's what it is. So D maps to A, and then we have M maps to Q. All right, so that's a good reminder, you know, your penmanship is still important because otherwise if I misread, like what I just did with my own writing, and I may accidentally mark your answer wrong. Okay, so are we good with this one? Yep. Does it really matter uh, to do it this way? Because for like F0, I mm -hmm. have QD, MN, and QM. Does it really matter that QM? No, it, there, there, Just making sure it's there are, let me see, three factorial. There are six ways to make this work. <laughs> so which which of the six ways you want to do, you know, it's up to you. Because all I did was I just made uh, F zero is A B. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So there's it it uh, the way you configure F one, F zero, and F one doesn't there's there the answer is not unique. There are multiple answers. All right. So that's question number two. Are we ready to move on? Okay. Then, yep. Uh, question about the number one. Mm -hmm. uh, on the aspect of the representation, so we have the definition of a mean. Question two. Sentence. Part so, one. Yeah. Okay. So the definition of f three x and y such that at least y and x. So what will happen if we change at least to every? You mean changing the existential to? For all? Yeah, for all. That would not, then you cannot find the answer, right? Because you know, um, because this part here, this entire part, is to describe a single element, x, y. So you know, it does not, you cannot have a for all on this side, because you know, then, then you, you, would have, you, you, would have, you would end up with let me see. Will you end up with an empty set? Because x, y is only referring to a single element. So it just wouldn't make sense. It just wouldn't make sense. That's yep. a really good question to this question. Mm -hmm. So what if you had like y, x, and then inside of the two parentheses it would be x, comma, y? Would it still hold? Say that again? Oh, yeah. So that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Right there you have um, y, comma, x, and then the double parentheses and y, comma, x again. What mm -hmm. if you said we had x, comma, y? Would that still hold? X comma Y, then you would not be flipping the order. Okay. Yep. Because I'm treating Y X as one single element, and that element has to be found in Y in uh, F two. The tuple has to be found in F two. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on to question number three, which is the same kind of format, but it's a little bit different. So the first part is still the same. We're just flipping the order. So this time, you know, we are using F2. We are flipping F2. So now we want to look at F3. So we'll say F3, you know, since I don't have enough space to do it here. So F3 is going to be A, B, right? Because we're flipping the item inside the two tuple. We have... Um, J, A, we have D, Q, D, and then we have Q, Q. All right, so that answers you know, the first part. This is you know, the, uh, for the first part of the question. 
So what about the second part of the question? Applying the predicate P1 to, the, to this particular F3, is it a function? Okay, so it's not a function. Very good. Okay, you guys recognize it's not a function. So now we have to read carefully what the question is asking. If the value is false, specify a special case that makes the quantified condition false. Make sure you describe the condition. In other words, if you look at P1 as a predicate, what do I choose as the quantified variable to make the condition fail? That's what it's asking. So let me go back to the um, Q, uh, P1 first. So I'm going back to the definition of Q1. Okay. So when we look up Q1, it is using W as a quantified variable. So the question is, what do I choose as this W so that this part here, the condition, would fail. That's what it's asking. But you have to be careful now because you know, W is an element of the domain or the proposed domain, such that you know the uh, it does not map to the codomain exactly once. That's basically what it's asking. So now we go back to the question and we'll see what W you know, can meet, meet that requirement. So which what, what do you think is the problem with this particular set as a function? When the w, w is equal to w equals q. It's q. Mm -hmm. Yep. Q is q, which mm -hmm. So when w is q, when the quantified variable w is q, then, you know, I'm just going to do a short form here, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be 2, and 2 does not equal to 1. So in your actual answer, you know, that would be acceptable as an answer, you know, because I don't want you to spend all your time just copying the whole thing you know, from P1. But I want a specific example. I want you to explain to me why F3 is not a function. So this is sufficiently explaining why it is not a function, because Q is mapping to two elements in the code domain. All right, so the rest of the question is similar, but not exactly the same. So now we have to look at what we're dealing with here. We still have your F0 mapping A to B. We still have F1 mapping B to C. But the requirements are different, because this time, I want F0 to be not injective, but surjective. F1 needs to be injective, but not surjective. So you have to pay attention to those requirements and make sure that you work out you know, how to meet all of these requirements. So once again, you know, I, you know, the graphical way you know, is the best way because it's visualized. Okay. Okay. I just accidentally you know, move something here. Okay, this is A. And this time A has four elements. So you have to make sure that you have B, D, Q, and A in it. And then we have set B. B has B, C, D in it. And then we have C, which has D, Q, J, A in it. All right. So now the question is, how do we define F0 that is not injective but surjective? If you think about it, you know, it cannot be injective. Now, whether it's surjective or not, you still have some control, but we want it to be surjective, but not. It can, it's not possible to be injective. Why? Why can't F0, which is mapping from A to B, be injective in this case? Exactly. It has more elements in the domain than there are elements in the codomain. So at least two of the domain elements are bound to map the same thing in the code domain. There's, there's no question about it, okay? All right, and F1 is mapping from B to C, and we want the compound function, okay? If you apply F0 to X first, and then you apply F1 to the result of F0 of X, we want it to just boil down to the original F of 2, which, which is a function, okay? This is indeed a function, so how do we make it happen? So you can see that you know, how D and Q, they both map to Q. So that gives you a pretty good clue you know, of what we need to do. 
So we have D and Q. Um, so now we have, okay, so whatever you map to Q, it doesn't matter. So let's say C maps to Q right here. Then D and Q from A would both map to C. So now we have this going to here. And then the rest, eh, it's up to you. You know, you can have B mapping to B, then B maps to D, and then D maps to D, and then D maps to one of these two. You know, let's say J. Oh, I cannot say just you know, one of those because I have to be specific this time. Okay, wait, hold on a second. Okay, I just, I just messed up. Sorry. Okay. Because I have to make sure that it reproduces the original F two. So. So what I have worked out so far is okay. Q and A. Let's see, Q and D. Okay. <sighs> okay. I cannot read my own. Yeah. Poor bad penmanship bites me again. Okay, this is A. So we want D and Q to map to the same thing, like so. And then the rest we have to work out. Let me get out of Discord. There we go. Okay. All right. So now we can work on this again. All right. So B, okay, let me go back to here. I want to point out. So B eventually has to map to A. So it's okay for B to map to B first, but then it has to map to A. All right. So. And then we want A to map to J eventually. So A can map to D first, because that's the only thing left. And then D has to map to J in this case. So with this, you know, then F0, okay, wrong part. So F0 in this case is going to be BB, uh, DC, QC, and then AD, and then F1 is going to be BA, um, CQ, and finally DJ. There we go. So once again, this is only one of the you know, six possible answers, okay? So you can there are six possible ways to answer this. This is just one of them. Okay, but we want to double check. Okay, is F zero indeed injective, but not? Excuse me, the other way around. Not injective, but surjective. Looks that way. Okay, we got you know, both B and Q mapping to C, so it cannot be injective. But at the same time, everything in B are mapped to, so it is surjective. Then we look at F one. Is it injective but not surjective? The answer is yes, because if you look at from the mapping from B to C, uh, every element in B maps to a unique element in C, so that makes it injective. Uh, but when you look at C, um, a particular element, I think D in this case, is not mapped to, so that makes it not surjective. So I just double check to make sure that everything is good. Are we okay so far? Okay. All right, so we are now working on question number four. Same deal. Okay, so now we look at F3 first. So F of three is just flipping everything. So we have A, C, Q, D, and then J, B. And then the answer to P of one, it is true. Because A, C, Q, D, J, B is a function. And then we look at part three. So we use this kind of approach again. <clears throat> so this time we have B, C, D over here. We have Q, J, B, and M. And then we have A, Q, J over here. And this time we want F0 to be injective but not surjective. And we want F1 to be not injective but surjective. So we flipped the um, requirement on the two functions that we are creating. But we still want f of 2 to do the same thing as 
you know, the combined function of F0 and F1. All right, so how do we do this? So what you do is you look at, um, so this one here, you can just go straight across, doesn't matter what order, as long as it is like this, you should be okay. So you first double check, is this injective? Okay, is it not surjective? It is not surjective because we can see M is not used. So in this case, it is not possible for you to make a function that is surjective because there are fewer elements in the domain than there are elements in the codomain. So the function is guaranteed to be not surjective. There's no way this can be surjective. Okay, so now the careful part is how do we map from, um, this is A, B, and C. So the new question is how do we map from B to C? So the way we map to from B to C has to reproduce the original F2 function. So that means your C after mapping to J has to map to A. So this has to go to here. And then D has to go to Q eventually. So D is going to B first, but then B eventually has to end up to Q. And oh, that's D. Yeah, D to B and then B to Q. And then the other one is B to J eventually. So B is going to Q first, then Q has to go to J, like so. So is it okay for me not to write it out in a set notation? You guys kind of get how to convert that into a set notation? Okay. Would you write it down? Sure. <laughs> so it is B, Q, C, J, and D, B, and then F1 will take Q to J, it will take J to A, and then finally it will take um, B to Q. There we go. But once again, there are other possible solutions, and this time we have more than six possible solutions because we have four choose three times six. That's the number of possible solutions. We'll get to the combinatorics later, okay? So we'll understand what is four choose three. So four choose three is four factorial divided by three factorial times one factorial. So I believe that is just four. So we have 24 possible answers in this case. Because NCO. Hmm? Is that called NCO? NCO? I don't think so. Are you talking about NC? Uh, NC? Yeah, Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Yep. But we will talk about that, you know, later on in the semester. So we are now on to the last question, number five. So Captain Jerk decides to use the space folding G function introduced in the Aleph node module to slightly encrypt 3D natural number based coordinates using a function H. So H is a new function that you are supposed to you know, define. But I tell you what it is mapping from and what where it's mapping to. So instead of only a double, you know, only have n times n, now we have n times n times n, because it is a three-dimensional natural number base coordinate. And we want to map it to a single natural number. There are 12 ways to do this. I'm even enumerating all 12 ways to do it. So the question now is, which one? So as a member of the Klingon intelligence, intelligence unit, you found that h of 11 to 3 is 417. So that's given to you, okay? You intercept the communication and you found that in one single case, H of 11 to three is 417. Explain step-by-step step how you resolve the actual definition of function H, quote equations slash definitions and use logic to explain your reasoning to fellow Klingon citizens. Okay, so how would you do this? The G function mentioned here is the is the G function 
that we talked about in the Aleph No module. So I would put that definition as a part of the answer first, okay? But you already know the final result is 417. In other words, you are given the natural number already. And you're trying to go backwards to find out how do we break 417 back into 11, 2, and 3. So what do you think is important here? It's the Aleph No module. What do we talk about in the Aleph No module? So there's the G function, okay? So what is the whole idea of the G function? What what was the original purpose of the function that we call G in the Aleph No module? Besides, what is Aleph No? Aleph No by definition is the cardinality of the set of natural numbers. Okay, very good, okay. So how do we know that a particular set, like the Cartesian product between natural numbers and natural numbers, how do we know that also has a cardinality of all of no? That's the that's the main part of the discussion, right? So what is the requirement? What do we what do we need in order to say, you know, that crazy set over there, the cardinality is also all of no. How do we know that? Because like the result of H would be like the Cartesian product between the set of natural numbers itself and itself again, mapping to the set of natural numbers. So it would make sense that all of no. no. Nope, nope. That's not what I'm asking. The first question that I'm asking is, oh, okay. Okay, it's asking, How do we know that? We can prove that G is an injective answer. We can prove that G is, okay, we are, we're heading in the right direction. Go ahead, I just couldn't hear the, the rest uh, of the sentence. We can prove that G is injective and surjective. It's bijective, exactly. So we can we have to prove that G is bijective, which we kind of did, okay? You're just kind of intuitively, because we are filling the corner first, and then we fill the diagonal line, then we, we fill another diagonal line, so the approach itself basically says, yes, you know, given you know, a particular tile, we will get to that tile eventually. So, and on top of that, because we are incrementing the counter for every tile, we also know that it is both injective and, and surjective. So we know that part already. And then what did we talk about? We talked about the closed form of the G function, right? Okay, and then what did we talk about? Because G is bijective, something has to exist. What has to exist? The inverse function. Okay, so that is what is important in this question, is the inverse function, the inverse G function. So what we want to do is to ask, what is, okay, I just miswrote it. What is the G inverse of the natural number of 417? And that's going to be a two-dimensional coordinate because it is the inverse. The whole purpose of the G function is to start with a two-dimensional coordinate and give us a natural number. So when we apply the inverse function, we should get you know, the two coordinates. Is that okay? Now, if you ask me and just say, Tech, can you regurgitate the entire equation? The answer is no. <laughs> but I know where to find it. Okay? So let's go ahead and find that equation and then see if we can apply that. All right, so we get to the notes here and hopefully it is still in one of the modules. Nope, not that one, I don't think. So where's all of no? Okay, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit here. This is a great plugin, by the way, because I typically have about you know, 10, 12 tabs on each window, and then I have like four or eight windows you know, open at the same time. It becomes almost impossible to remember exactly where to find a tab for a particular thing. 
This is a search feature based on the tabs. So I can just type what I'm looking for in the title of the tab. It will find it, and it will go there for me. <laughs> yes. Um, when somebody needs a tool to help to locate a certain tab, it is probably a little bit too much. But because of this tool, I can keep using this approach to kind of read material and do research and do all kinds of stuff. What's the name of the plugin? Sorry? What's the name of the plugin? Say again? What's the name of the plugin? The, bl the plugin? Yeah. I think it's just your know, tab search. Right. There you go. Yeah, it's just tab search. Great, super useful feature, at least for me, you know, for people with ADHD, this is like, yes. <clears throat> it can mask a lot of symptoms. <laughs> That's what it's doing. All right, so this whole thing, I, I landed on the, the place where we are resolving W. So we have to resolve W, and N is the um, natural number itself. So what we need to do now is to plug in those things, okay? So, oh, right. So I have to copy the equation. And I don't think this is an easy way to copy, so I have to do it by hand. Okay. Okay. So W is the floor of the square root of 8n plus 1, the whole thing minus 1, divided by 2. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I can show you the, the whole thing now. So n is 417 in this case. So now we are looking at 417 times 8. So we got 6, 5, 3 here, and the 1 here, and 33. 33,036. So what is the square root of that plus 1? So we're looking at the square root of this number here. <laughs> a calculator may be, may be useful in this case. So, um, okay, what if somebody tells me, I don't have a calculator, or I don't have a scientific calculator, but I have a normal, you know, kind of you know, one of those dollar calculator that you get for free when you sign up for a new bank account. So what do you do in that case? How do you how do you estimate the square root of thirty three hundred thirty seven? I go to the next perfect square over. Hmm? I go to, I go to the next perfect square over. So in this case, uh, four thousand, and then I go to the one lower. So that would be like okay, like like, like, like uh, I don't know, nineteen squares. Okay. Yeah. So the way I look at this is 50 times 50 is 2,500. Is that right? Okay, so this is below. 50 is the lower bound. And then I look at 60 times 60, that's 3,600. So I know whatever I'm looking is in between. Okay, so if I know it is somewhere in between, where do I start? Should I start with 51? Should I start with 59 or what? 55, binary search, okay? That's the key to do it. So now I use my $1 calculator and find that 55 times 55 is 3025. Three, three, there we go. So what do you think is my natural next to guess? 57, okay, okay, so we'll try 57. So 57 times 57 is 3, okay, I'll write here, 3, 2, 4, 9, 3, 2, 4, 9. All right, we are almost there, okay, so I'm just going to bump it up to 58 just to be sure. I think that may be the answer already, but I'll double check. So 20, 58 times 58 is 3, 3, 6, 4, so that's already over. Okay, so we are so we are good, because we have to take the floor. Oh, we have to divide it by two and then take the floor, but you know, it's knowing it's between fifty-seven and fifty-eight is fine. That's that's sufficient. So we take fifty-seven, we subtract one from it, or fifty, because it's going to be fifty-seven point something. We subtract one, so we get fifty-six point something divided by two. We have twenty-eight point something, and then take the floor of that. We have twenty-eight. 
Okay, so W is 28. Oh, what is 28 again? Twenty-eight is the sum of the x and the y. So I still do not know, you know, what is the x and the y, right? Okay. So at this point, okay, if you say, okay, I don't have a good calculator, you know, um, how many possible choices are we looking at here? This is, by the way, the name or the number of the diagonal line. Yes. Oh, okay. So we okay. That's okay. You know, I just want to make sure it is a false. Positive and not a false negative, you know. So if, when somebody actually has a question, you know, I do not address that. That would be bad. When you don't have a question, you just scratch your head and go. Do you have a question? That's not too bad. Okay. Anyway, getting back to this, diagonal line zero has one pixel. Diagonal line one has two pixels. So using that, how many possible pixels do we have here? The, just counting the number of pixels as you go through the diagonal line. There are 29 pixels because it ranges from 0 to 28. So there are 29 pixels on that line. So the worst you have to do is to go through every single one and see and apply the G function and see which one works out. But you don't have to do that even because what you do, okay, so let, let's take a look at the G function, what it, what, what it looks like. Um, okay, this is not my usual notepad, so it's a little bit harder for me to find an empty space to do this. So let me see if I have any empty space. No, I don't. Okay, back, there we go. Okay, I can, I can try to kind of carve out a little area, maybe here. G of x, y, is x plus y times x plus y plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2 plus y. I hope that looks at least somewhat familiar. I hope you at least know where to find this equation or this definition. So tell me again, what is that w? X plus y. It is x plus y. Oh, OK. So that means I can just go like, oh, this is just w. This is just w. So I'm just looking at 28 times 29, the whole thing divided by 2, plus some unknown y. Okay, I need to solve for that y. And this has to equal, has to, has to, equal to what? This whole thing. Has to equal to 417. That is correct. Okay. So now, can we figure that out? Okay, so now we can solve for y. Once we solve for y, how do we solve for x? Exactly, because w is the sum between x and y, and we know y already, then you just go for w minus y, that becomes x. So now that's solve for x, y. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve for everything here, because I, won't, I don't want to leave any of this hanging. So 28 8 times 29, the whole thing divided by 2, is 406. So this portion here is 406. So that means y is what? Uh, 417 minus 406 is 11, which also means x is going to be um, 28 minus 11 is 17, there we go, there we go. All right, so how do we make use of this result in the original question? We just went through a whole bunch of stuff because I don't have a scientific calculator. But we did end up with the coordinate, right? We performed G inverse of 417 and we got the result, okay? So I go back here, I got the result of 1711. All right, so let's just say that you're running out of time, okay? But you want to give me at least something that, so that I can, I, have an ex, I can have an excuse to give you partial credit. So what do you, what do you think you can limit out of these 16 choices here? Uh, which ones do you think is a possible answer? Just using this result, yep? The G of, G of Y 
comma z, uh, and then parentheses comma x. Uh, so like it's about two thirds of the way down. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one on the R is the only two options that you have. That is correct. Very good. So what we can do at this point, if I totally run out of time and I just want to go like, okay, I want to give tech an excuse to give me some partial credit. I'm just going to say, okay, we only got this one as a choice and this one as a choice. Out of these two, one of these two is the answer. I don't know which one yet because I just ran out of time because I forgot to bring a scientific calculator. Why? So see, that deduction is correct. But what gave this away that we can now narrow down to just two possible choices? Yes? Uh, I was able to narrow it down because uh, if you take a look, so because we only have three variables in mm -hmm. each, um, they are one, unique. One of the two variables that we got from the process uh, between either x or y would have to be one of those three. Yep. Um, and so. And we got x, y, z. Yeah. We and see, then, we don't see these two. Yep. So x had to be one of them. And yep. So, and there, there are only these yeah. two using x as the second. Uh, parameter of the outermost application of G. So now we can narrow down to one, only one of these two. So that would give me an excuse to give a lot of partial credit because we have shown the approach. Because at this point, we just have to recursively apply the same approach, which means now we look at the other one, we look at this 17, and we say 17 is either the G of YX, YZ, or the, the G of ZY. So with this one, because we are only down to like two choices, we can actually just kind of plug in the numbers. <laughs> you just plug in G of uh, G of two three and see whether it's seventeen. Because if it's not seventeen, then it's the other one. Because it's either this one or it is this one over here. So we plug two or three into the value of n. Or no. If you want to use the inverse of n, which is a little bit harder because it involves the square root of, then you will be plugging 17 to it. Because this 17 is either this or that. So you plug 17 to the g inverse function so that you can figure out which two coordinate do I get out of the, the inverse of g applied to 17. Is that okay? Yeah, yep. so like the inverse takes one variable and makes it into two, and then yep. the regular function does the opposite. Yep. Yeah, g going, g itself takes two numbers and combines, com turning into one single natural number, and then g inverse is going to do the reverse. You give it a single natural number, it comes back with a two dimensional coordinate. So that represents. That represents the floor. Or, sorry, I mean, you can have class. I can talk about it. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, you know, I know we are running out of time, but I'm just going to do this, you know, just because I want to do it. So, if it is 2, 3, okay, which way is it? Okay, so we know 2 plus 3 is 5. Okay, so we know without taking into consideration the y part, it's going to be 5 times 6, the whole thing divided by 2. Let me see. Yeah, so it's two. It's 5 plus 6 divided by 2, so that would give us 15, okay? And then 15 plus 2 is 17. So 15 plus 2 is, is my 17? Uh, right here. Oh. Yeah, so, so we know the y is 2, or well, the second part is 2. So that means, but two in the original question is our y. So we know the y is the second part. So we, we now narrow down to the last one. Is, does that make sense? Could you repeat? Sure, yeah. I, I, I wish I had enough room you know, in this you know, space here. Okay, so I just did a g of two, three. And that is, um, okay, that's not what I did. What did I do? Okay.
that's g of x y. That's by definition. You know, well, it's not by definition, but we derived the function g. So what we know is this eventually becomes 17. That's what we know. We also know x plus y is 5, because we just do not know is x2 or and y3, or is x3 and y2. That's the only part that we do not know. Is that OK? So by so then we can work out this portion here, because it doesn't matter what whether x is 3, y is 2, or x is 2, y is 3, x plus y is still 5, right? So now we get a 5 here, we get a 6 here, we get 30 you know, as the numerator, divided by 2, we have 15. But we know this value is 17, because this particular value is going to here. So we know this adds up to 17. We know this part here alone is 15, and that's, that's why we know this y is a 2. Does that make sense? Okay. So knowing this y is here, this is 2, then we ask um, the other one has to be 3. So we now know that g of 3, 2 is 17. But in the original, in the question right here, the 2 is the y. So now we know, you know, the y is becoming the second component of the nested application of g. So now we know that this last one is the answer. Is that okay? So we did all of this without a scientific calculator. Yes. Well, we can use it on the test. Yes, you can. You can even use a graphing calculator to you know, make a super fancy plot. I don't need to see it, but if you <laughs> want to, to do something fancy, fancy on the calculator, that's fine. But I just want to illustrate the fact that even without a scientific calculator, with <clears throat> this kind of math, we can still work it out within a reasonable amount of time. Okay. All righty. So I'll see all of you next Monday. Have a nice weekend. And if, when you're studying, you encounter any questions, you do not hesitate to let me know. I do have office hours tomorrow and on Friday. And then Monday is the last day that we have a class before the exam. So bring all your questions on Monday if you have any questions. Okay. Let me stop the recorder and then I'll start to answer questions.